What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another video from the Scalar Learning Channel. And today, we are doing something that I've wanted to do for a very, very long time, and that is sit down with an educational therapist and talk about different learning differences and how they impact math education for all sorts of different individuals. I have parents ask me about this topic all the time, and I wanted to get something really well made on camera so that you guys all have an amazing resource when and if these questions do come up. So without further ado, I wanna introduce Dr. Jonathan Schaefer, who is an educational therapist based in Los Angeles. So Jonathan, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. So first, tell us a little bit about your background. So I'm super happy to talk to you um, because uh, a lot of my kids end up needing um, math support, tutoring support, uh, and also uh, standardized te test prep support and sometimes college admissions support. Uh, and so I'm happy to connect with you and get engaged with your channel. So I'm an educational therapist and a lot of people don't know what that really means. Um, so it's not like psychotherapy and it's not tutoring. I help kids to develop strategies so that they can access their schoolwork more easily. So kids usually come to me and they have some kind of learning disorder going on, or they have an emotional disorder or an attentional disorder, or something just isn't working right for them in school. It doesn't need to be defined, but they're having problems that go beyond just being confused by a teacher. So what we do is work one-on-one, -on -one, uh, and we figure out exactly what their problem is that they're having in school, and we find ways to identify their strengths so that they can kind of pull vault over their problems. I see. One thing that parents always ask me about first, so we're gonna kind of go top down. The first thing is sometimes we hear this term math anxiety. I hear it all the time because obviously my thing is only math. And I wanted to know your take. What does that mean? What is math anxiety? Anxiety related to math. <laughs> so anxiety can be understood as something that we have as animals. All animals have anxiety. It's really helpful. It keeps us from getting eaten by tigers. In real life, we don't have tigers. And so brains can amplify worries so that they become anxieties that can prevent us from doing what we want to get done. So regular anxiety is actually really helpful. It lets me know that I have to do something. Uh, it only becomes a problem if it interferes with my work. So math anxiety is a problem that's tied to, so it's a problem that it's an anxiety that's triggered by math. That's all. Uh, and the question becomes how big is it and what to do about it? Uh, so there are a lot of things to do about math anxiety. Uh, what can help is cultivating a sense of power, cultivating a sense of um, peace, and uh, helping the child to see that they do know how to do the kinds of problems that they're going to have to do. And there are a lot of ways to get there, but math anxiety is anxiety that's caused by doing math, and it can be helpful to, it can be helpful to listen to, uh, and there are a lot of ways to work with it. What are some of the most common ways that it develops that you've seen? For example, what I've seen with some of my students is it can be a particularly tough teacher that maybe they just don't connect with and then that embeds this idea and this is again from my experience that it embeds that idea that maybe math is in, as a general sense like too challenging and then they just that belief gets ingrained in them we have to we have to remove it by you know good positive reinforcement helping them understand etc in your experience like what do you see as some of the most common root causes lack of understanding mm -hmm. if they don't if they don't really understand the math then they will walk into a test and be blindsided. Yeah. And if you get blindsided, it's reasonable to be anxious. So it can be helpful to recognize, hey, I'm feeling anxiety. But actually that anxiety is not limitless. It was caused by this test and I have things I can do about it. So feeling the anxiety is just helping us know what has to be done. And so what a kid can do is find their power they can realize, actually, this teacher seems scary, but I'm going to go talk to her at office hours. And when I see her, when I talk to her one-on-one, -on -one, actually, she's really caring. And she just wants me to understand the material. Or if they really just don't get along with a teacher, if they're clashing, they just need to find a different resource, a tutor or a different math teacher or 
sometimes a parent, um, grandparent, who can help them to build understanding of the math. But the core problem is that they probably don't understand what they're doing. And so they just need to be helped to figure out how to do it. Right. Got it. Okay, now I'd like to switch gears and I'd love to talk about some of these learning differences yeah. and how they impact specifically uh, math understanding. So let's start at the top. Probably one of the ones that I hear the most often is ADHD. So first, can you yeah. start, tell us a little bit generally what is ADHD and how does it usually manifest in terms of mathematics? This is the biggest one. So about a fourth of my clients come in with ADHD um, symptoms, uh, sometimes with a diagnosis. About five or 10% of people have ADHD uh, and it is a very poorly named disorder. It does not need to include a lack of attention and it does not need to include hyperactivity. So it's historically named. The core problem in ADHD is a deficit in self-regulation. So that self-regulation applies to attention. It applies to activity. But activity and attention are actually the result of a lack of self-regulation, a deficit in self-regulation. Okay. And so um, ADHD can impact students in school in broad ways and in discrete ways. So with math, um, self-regulation in class can mean if I'm not understanding what the teacher is saying, I need to focus more on what he's saying. But if a person comes in with ADHD, they might recognize that I don't understand what's happening right now. I don't like not understanding, so I'm gonna go on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So uh, the self-regulation can mean very commonly an inability to stop doing things that you find pleasurable, like YouTube, gaming, whatever, uh, and to start doing the things that you have to do. I see, okay. What would you recommend, like what's the first thing, and again, I'm sure it's a sp very specific case by case thing, but in general, what would be your general first recommendation when you encounter students that are having problems in math with ADHD? What are you, what's your usual typical go-to? I like to explore what the child is perceiving what they're actually picking up in class. And their attention in class commonly will come through as a dashed line of attention. So they'll, they'll pick up on this snippet, and then that snippet, and then that snippet, but they won't see the through line. And um, what they'll, the way that the child sees it um, is confusion. I just don't understand her. I just, he's so confusing. Um, I don't get it, and so I don't know what I'm doing on the homework, so I don't turn in my homework, and then I get in trouble. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about something a little bit more math specific, which is dyscalculia. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yeah, you are. Okay. Let's first t tell us what is dyscalculia first. Yeah. Uh, so dyscalculia is a disorder uh, that is, so it's a medical thing. It's something that happens in brains that we're born with. Uh, and I guess, can we back up to ADHD? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, ADHD is... Um, partially uh, genetic, but partially um, based on environment. It's not really known how it, how it arrives, but it does run in families sometimes. Uh, and so it is called a disorder, and disorders are things that, are, that exist in brains. Um, so with dyscalculia, so that's ADHD. With dyscalculia, um, it is a discrete disorder that, in, that impacts math. Mm -hmm. So there are different, different flavors of dyscalculia. Uh, but they come out as having a hard time doing math. Um, so it can be a hard time understanding what numbers mean. It can be a hard time doing arithmetic. It can be a hard time doing uh, the more advanced functions that you get in algebra. Uh, it, can be, it can show up as a lack of automaticity. So maybe a third grader is having a really hard time le learning her times tables. Uh, and repetition isn't cutting it. And that could be a sign of, of dyscalculia. I see. What is a, what do you typically do with students when you work with them when they have dyscalculia? The trick there is to use as many sensory inputs as possible at the same time. So if we can use manipulatives, 
that helps a lot. If we can use some kind of a three-dimensional object to hold on to, to understand, so that, this is to build number sense. Sure. Um, so to build number sense, you start by counting objects. And then from, once you have a sense of what numbers mean, so once you have a sense of what numbers mean, you can manipulate them. What, what number comes next? What number came before? If we count by two, what happens next? And then that can be a bridge into addition and subtraction. But it is really helpful to repeatedly make this multi-sensory connection of, I have this, little, this many objects, I write that number in this way, I say that name of that number in this way, and rinse and repeat as many ways as possible. So you can write it in the air, um, you can make it a song, um, but you'd need to build a number sense. And then when you get to calculation, you need to build repetition and calculation in as many sensory ways as possible. So elementary school math teachers are kind of magic at this. Um, so elementary school math teachers are kind of magic at this, about finding ways to help kids um, build an understanding of numbers uh, in as many ways as they need to. Now let's shift to another disorder. Let's talk about dyspraxia. So once again, what is dyspraxia? So dyspraxia is a neuromuscular disorder. So it is a difficulty in controlling motor functions, so how you move. Okay. Um, dyspraxia is um, quite broad. It's, it's big motor control um, as well as fine motor control. Uh, so kids with dyspraxia often have trouble with coordination. They have trouble in sports. Mm -hmm. They might describe themselves as clumsy. Mm -hmm. um, and it's often embarrassing for kids to have dyspraxia. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's helpful to take a very light approach um, that there, a lot of kindness helps with dyspraxia. What is the relationship between dyspraxia and dysgraphia? So dyspraxia is a broad term uh, that describes uh, generalized fine motor challenges, difficulty in fine motor control uh, and bigger motor control. Uh, dysgraphia is a subcategory of that that, spe that specifically applies to writing. So kids with dysgraphia come to my practice with um, handwriting that they describe as messy. Mm -hmm. And in spe specifically in relation to math, like how does that manifest in mathematics? So um, handwriting that is not neat has a big impact on mathematics. So the reason that dysgraphia shows up as a math difficulty is that we know that mathematicians do well by showing their work. Mm -hmm. If you can write down your thinking, then you think, or, then you're thinking clearly. And so we, counts, we coach our kids, we teach our kids to show their work. Well, if they are showing their work, but it is hard to read, then it's hard to make sense out of what they're showing. So a way to understand this graphia is to imagine taking a pencil and I'm right-handed. So for me, take my pencil, take a pencil and put it in my left hand and then try to, try to write with it. And if I try to write with a way that my brain has not learned to write, I'm going to have messy handwriting. And if I'm trying to make a very careful record of this algebra problem, uh, it's gonna be hard for me to line my numbers up on top of each other. It might be hard to tell the difference between different numbers. And so it will be very easy for me to become confused. What is your usual first go-to when somebody comes to you with the in that situation where they have dysgraphia and they're having difficulty, what's the first couple things that you might recommend? Handwriting can be, is, is a skill that can be built. Okay. If we can learn to play baseball, we can learn to have, have neat handwriting. Uh, so people with dysgraphia just have a harder time building that neatness, but there are writing programs that I use. So handwriting without tears is a really helpful one. And it is, it's wonderful actually, it's really fun. Kids learn to hold their pencils in an effective way. They learn that posture helps a lot. Mm. Putting our feet on the ground helps a lot. Having our paper tilted in the right way helps a lot. And then we practice forming the letters, and then we practice forming the numbers. And we just practice it a lot. <laughs> and you can practice it with multi-sensory methods. Uh, so you can write in the air, you can write on your hand, you can write on sandpaper, uh, you can write in sand, uh, and Eventually, you develop the idea, in, it, it's deeply ingrained in your um, motor cortex, uh, of 
how to form numbers the way that numbers should look. I see. And now I want to shift gears a little bit. I yeah. want to talk about, and I know that there's a, a spectrum for this in particular, but what about a person with autism? Tell us first a little bit about what that means, what it can mean depending on placement on the spectrum, and then we can talk about it in relation to math. Yeah, autism is a tricky disorder to describe because it is so diverse. There's a saying that if you, um, if you meet an autistic person, then you've met an, an autistic person. So there is no generalized way to describe how an autistic person might approach math. There, I, there's not much of a correlation uh, between difficulty in math and autism. I think that the percentage of people who are autistic who have difficulty in math is probably, and I'm, I'm not sure about this, but I think that it's probably the same as the percentage of people who have difficulty who do not have autism. Mm. So I, there shouldn't be, uh, to my understanding, there's not an increased proportion of people with autism who have difficulty with math. So I would say that with autism, there just, there isn't a math specific difficulty. It becomes a challenge to help the autistic child access the instruction. And so if they're struggling in math, it is this is a place where it really does help to be customized, to talk to the child and find out what's happening. Um, are they having trouble, are they having trouble um, connecting to the teacher? Are they having trouble following a dynamic classroom environment? Uh, people with autism frequently have either hyposensitivity or hypersensitivity, and so um, um, sensory sensitivity. Uh, and so, classrooms can sometimes uh, be overstimulating to a person with autism, and they would benefit. So it might be they might be hypersensitive to sounds, or they might be hyper hypersensitive to light or to too much motion happening around them. And so finding a way to help this person manage the sensory input that they're receiving can be great. It can really help them calm down in the classroom and access that instruction from the teacher. Um, forming a personal connection to the teacher can be really helpful too. Building trust can decrease anxiety. Um, anxiety can be pretty common with autism. Um, and that's helped a lot by just building personal connections, building understanding of this is the person I am, this is how it helps me to be in a classroom. How can you help me in your classroom? Let's say we have a student that is having difficulty in math. The parents are noticing it. The student has anxiety, but we don't know what's going on. We're at the yeah. very beginning steps of, of noticing this. What is the first thing or the first few things that a family should do or parents should do? The way that math is taught these days is often very different from the way that we were taught when we were children. And so parents are often um, flummoxed by common core math of um, what on earth are they doing? Uh, it can, and so if a parent is confused by the way that the math is being taught in the school, uh, it's, it can be hard for the parent to be helpful to the child. Mm -hmm. So in that case, um, what I would do is if my child were having trouble in math, I would talk to my teacher. I would try to find out exactly what is happening. So is the homework not being turned in? Is the performance on tests the problem? Uh, where exactly is the difficulty? Has it been long lasting or is it just this one unit? Uh, and so talk, going to the teacher is the first thing. Um, teachers will know the child's math best. After that, I would say work, find a good tutor. Um, find a tutor who is great, great at teaching math. It's hard to find a good math tutor at every level of math. It's hard to find a good math tutor. Um, if that isn't working, then the child would probably graduate to educational therapy. Be, if tutoring isn't enough, then educational therapy is usually the next best spot. Uh, and essentially what you're trying to do is find a way to let that child talk to an expert who can understand what's happening for the child. So it happens with a, just a lot of conversation of, how do you approach this problem? And then I simply watch and ask questions. And um, when I can see where the child gets stuck, I can help the child figure out a way to get unstuck. I'd also like to talk about dyslexia. So for people who, once again, aren't sure what dyslexia is, can we define it? And then also let's talk about it in relation to math as well. People with dyslexia have a core deficit in um, hearing 
the distinct elements of language. And from that, that kernel of, of a deficit, uh, they have trouble with figuring out the sounds that printed words make, mm -hmm. and they have trouble with spelling the letters that sounds make. So they have trouble connecting the sounds of a word to the letters of a word. Okay, I see. How do you see that usually manifesting specifically in terms of in uh, math education? So dyslexia is a difficulty with processing text, basically. So a child with, with dyslexia needs to learn how to break words apart to figure out the way to pronounce the sounds that the letters represent. And then they also need to learn the complement to that, which is spelling. The way that dyslexia impacts math is kind of twofold. So there are commonly co-occurring disorders with dyslexia of dyscalculia and ADHD. Okay. It's not uncommon to find them together. Uh, but if it is just dyslexia, uh, the challenge there is that language is our way to understand math. And so if the child has a hard time reading they, or spelling, they might, have a hard time, they might have a hard time reading what the teacher wrote on the board to describe the math. And they might have a hard time taking notes to write down how to do the math in their own words. So this ties back to using a child's superpowers to get them across any difficulties that they have. And very commonly, if a child is having trouble with math, I like to see, well, okay, are you strong with language? And if they are, we can use their language strengths to help build over their math weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of ways to do this. So with dyslexia, we might not have that opening of helping the child to use language to get into the nonverbal um, math reasoning. Got it. I'd also like to talk about visual processing disorders and their relation to mathematics. So can you set that up first? What is, what is a visual processing disorder? A visual processing disorder, um, auditory processing disorders like this too, it are, it, it's a difficulty in processing visual information. And so it's not something that can be corrected with glasses. Um, it is a deficit that happens in the brain. So the visual cortex is in the back. And um, people with visual processing disorders have a hard time um, making sense out of what they see. It can be exhausting to make sense out of a complicated page. And so uh, it can be also hard to graph. If, if the graph, you know, if the, if the point is three comma two, it can be really hard to find out where that line is and then where that point is to put that, to put that point. Uh, so people who are working with visual processing disorders in math benefit from simplifying their visual field. And so what that looks like is presenting one problem per page. Yeah. Working on an iPad can be magic. Uh, if they can work in Notability or some other application like that where they can simplify their page, then they can have a much better chance of getting to it. They also benefit commonly from doing their math work when their eyes are not tired, when their brain is not tired. So maybe it's, maybe it's doing it in the morning, maybe it's doing it at noon, maybe it's doing it at 9 p.m. It depends on the person. But um, processing visual information is exhausting. Uh, and so they need to do it when they have the strength. I see. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. This was, I think, super useful for, for me, for everybody uh, watching. So I think that's incredible. And if people want to find your website, find your information, how do they do that? Well, it's a pleasure talking to you, too. This has been great. So people can find me at lamindworks.com. Got it. All right, that is it, everybody. I hope you found this super helpful. Like I said, I've been wanting to make this video for everybody for a super long time. So I hope you found that very, very useful. Thank you so much. And if you do like this video, make sure to click that like button. And if you want to see more from the Scalar Learning channel, make sure to click subscribe. Thank you guys so much for joining, and I'll see you in the next video. Take it easy.